I can barely endure to watch the news anymore. Is there anybody here who still watches the news? Good. Good. One person? Oh, no. Guys, stop. Repent. Stop ingesting that garbage. It's absolutely mind-boggling to me how these news news anchors can just lie, 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 lie. What are they anchored onto anyways? Nothing. The manipulation in the news media today is otherworldly. It's alien. Stop watching it. The only thing the fake news garbage media is selling you is fear and manipulation. They're banking on the fact that you trust their word and that you continue to live in fear and misery. Now, some have said, why would they do that? You know, why would they do that? Well, because you keep watching it. Because you keep tuning in. Because the ratings continue to grow. Because fear and misery sell. If there's something this world is lacking, it's hope. A real enduring hope. And guess what? You're not getting it on CNN, NBC, Fox, ABC, whatever else channels there are. You're not going to get it there. You're going to get trash. The world needs hope. And the more I consider the state of the world we live in, the more convinced I am that Jesus is the only hope. So I guess the fake news garbage media has done something positive, for, for me at least. It's convinced me that Jesus is the way, even more. But I don't know if you've noticed, although the world has been baptized into misery and fear, people don't seem to want Jesus. You can drive yourself mad trying to reach people for Jesus, trying to convince them of their need, even though it's never been greater. You see them starving for hope, but they won't eat this delicious banquet that Jesus is offering of hope. I think that the problem we're facing is that sometimes, many times, we're trying to do this in our own strengths. That's why it can become frustrating. We have this power in us, the Holy Spirit, and He's the one who saves sinners. Sometimes we forget that. Our only responsibility is relying on Him to give us boldness to speak the truth and live the truth. And I hear people saying this all the time. Well, what good is it? What good is that accomplishing whatever you're doing? Has anyone come to the Lord? Listen, that's not my job. My job is not to uh, get results. That's God's job. That's, that's God's job. Your job is not to meet a quota of souls. Your job is simply to speak the truth in love. That's it. If souls get saved, good. If they don't, what can you do about that? Nothing. God saves sinners, not you. You must only speak the truth. And when you realize that reality, then there's no more frustration. There's no more, no more stress. Because you realize God is the Savior and you are not. I know that sounds kind of basic, doesn't it? Of course God's the Savior and I'm not. But... Why then do we get so frustrated when people don't come to the Lord? Last week we learned about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the sign of tongues. Uh, this week we're going to walk through the sermon that Peter pre preached uh, to the multitudes who were gathered for the, for the Feast of Pentecost. This sermon is really about one thing. Boldness in the Holy Spirit to tell the world that true hope in life are only found in the one who defeated death, Jesus Christ. Period. 
Peter was, or Peter, sorry, Pentecost was a strange, strange scene. Jerusalem was busy with the hustle and bustle of the feast, and, and there in the middle of the city was a small group of Galileans speaking every language under the sun. A rather large crowd began to form to see the strange sight. They had heard these humble Galileans speaking in their own native language, and not just speaking it, but proclaiming the mighty works of God fluently. And many in the crowd were amazed by this sight. I mean, what could this mean? But there were still another group among the crowd, those who dismissed the miraculous sign. They said, you know what, this is no miracle, guys. Come on, don't be deceived by these Galileans. They're just drunk. They're just drunk. But Peter, standing in the midst of disciples, he saw the crowd that gathered, and, and he saw the look of amazement on their faces for what the Holy Spirit had done. But he also heard the murmurings of the crowd and, and how they supposed that they were just drunk. When he heard the mockers and the scoffers spreading the drunken report about, he quickly arose to set the record straight. The scripture says Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. He immediately dispels the notion that they were just drunk. In Acts 2, 14 and 15, Peter says, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. That's a very nice and eloquent way of saying, listen, guys, we're not drunk. It's only 9 a.m. It's only 9 in the morning. We're not drunk. Who drinks in the morning? Maybe some people, but not us. Instead, what you're seeing and what you're hearing is something you actually know very well. Peter is alluding to the prophecy found in the, in the prophet Joel, and he quotes it in Acts 2, 17 and 21. He says, this is the thing you know well. It's not that we're drunk. You already know. He says, the prophet says, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What these people could not see was that the event unfolding before their very eyes is the very event they were all waiting for. The outpouring of God's Spirit onto His people. Every believer in the Jewish God was waiting for the day, the prophet Joel said, when God would liberally pour out His Spirit on His people. These weren't drunken fools stumbling over tables and drooling on each other. No, these people were filled with the very Spirit of God, the very life of God Himself. And, and the Israelites supposed them to be drunks. Let's talk about God working in mysterious ways. <laughs> the sign of tongues at Pentecost and the outpouring of the Spirit was the beginning of the last days. See, a lot of people are talking uh, uh, lately about we're in the last days. Well, yeah, we've been in the last days. <laughs> it's been 2,000 years of the last days. The outpouring of the Spirit was a powerful confirmation that Jesus is the, is the promised Savior. And that the, the, and that the whole thing, the, the outpouring of the Spirit, all of it, was to give power, power to his disciples to be witnesses to the world that Jesus is alive. That's what it's all about. And you know, I know it's like the second last Sunday in January... We're getting close to February, which means we're getting close to March, which means we're getting close to April and Easter. And that's what it's all about. Being a witness of the resurrection. And that's what Peter does with this new power. He witnesses to the resurrection in verse 22. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. 
God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. You know, the thing I love so much about Peter's sermon here is like, well, the whole thing, but just how bold he is in his proclamation. He speaks with such conviction, with such just in-your-face honesty. And, and just in passing, it's kind of worth noting here uh, that the boldness that Peter is exhibiting here is indeed, I believe, a lost fruit of the Spirit in our context. Charles Spurgeon said, Oh, my brethren, bold-hearted men are always called mean-spirited by cowards. Yikes. In our day and age, the things Peter says in this sermon would be viewed by so many pastors as too harsh. Today's cookie-cutter pastor would pull Peter aside and say, you know why? I've heard this stuff. You know, Peter, you may want to use a little more wisdom in how you speak to the people. After all, Peter, don't you know you catch more bees with honey or with sugar than with vinegar? I guess bees produce honey. <laughs> flies, I think. Whatever. You know how the saying goes. Flies, yeah. You catch more fl No, why would you want to catch flies? Anyways, why would you want to catch bees either? You get, the, you get the point. The irony in all this is that Peter is said to be full of the Holy Spirit when he spoke this way. The Holy Spirit came upon the disciples to empower them to be witnesses to the resurrection. And that power was first demonstrated in the speaking of many languages, which was then followed up with uncompromised boldness in fire. Peter stands up in front of all these people and he boldly tells them, You know Jesus. You saw his mighty works and the signs he did. He was delivered up according to the plan of God, but you crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. Imagine that, eh? Like, this miraculous sign happens, and then everybody gathers, and you have this opportunity to preach the word of God to them. And the first thing you tell them is, you killed Jesus. <laughs> you did it, you lawless heathen. Well, that doesn't sound very inviting, does it? <laughs> that doesn't sound very evangelistic. It's a huge accusation. A huge accusation that everybody knew was 100% accurate. But Peter, full of the fire of the Spirit, came not to proclaim death, but life. So it doesn't end there. He then utters the two most beautiful words in the English language. He says, but God. But God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death. Because it's impossible for the author of life to be held, by, held down by death. Yes, you are lawless, and you handed them over to lawless men. You handcuffed the author of life. You mercilessly pinned him to a bloody cross with common criminals. But God, it didn't end there. This Jesus whom you crucified, don't forget it, was raised back to life. He is alive. And the message of him, of Jesus, of the Christ, is a message of life restored. Peter is in no way condemning the people. He himself denied Jesus. How could he? This is good news of great joy for Peter as well. Jesus is alive. Death is defeated. And Peter quotes from Psalm 16, where David uh, speaks of the resurrection prophetically. He quotes Psalm 16 in Acts 2.28, where he says, You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. All the scriptures speak of Jesus in one way or another. We need to understand that. And David in Psalm 16 is corroborating Peter's statement that it was, it was not possible for death to hold him down. As Jesus was stumbling under the heavy weight of his cross, his path that most would see as death and condemnation was actually to result in life and gladness in God's presence, not just for him, but for us as well. Ultimately, Jesus is the path of life, and he's come to make us know the path of, of life, which is him. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says. 
Now, some of us are naturally bold people. I don't know if that's the right word, but we're naturally more, I don't know, bold. I'll say, I'll say it nicely. But for the great majority, boldness doesn't really come easy. Now, look, I'm the kind of person who doesn't like confrontation. I don't like drama. I just, everyone just get along, you know. But, but when I got saved and the Holy Spirit came to dwell in me, he put this uncompromising love for truth in me. And sometimes, uh, you know, people close to me will say, like, well, what does it matter? What does it matter? What does it matter? You know, it's not affecting you. What does it matter? Because truth matters. It matters. Even if it doesn't affect me, and it does, everything affects you. The sin of your neighbor affects you. It does. And, and this, this pandemic has, has shown that to be tremendously true. Boldness is something we need to be constantly praying for. And in my own life, I've seen the Holy Spirit rush upon me with boldness that wasn't my own. When we took a small team to the riverfront to evangelize the anti-lockdown protesters back in the fall. And I had an idea about how this should go down, right? I mean, my idea was we would wait up on Oled Avenue. We'd wait there, and as they marched to the health unit, we would have conversations with people about Jesus. That was how I envisioned, envisioned this thing happening. But those of us who were there know that didn't happen. <laughs> Didn't go, it didn't go down that way. You know, we were up on Olet, Olet Avenue. We were looking at them gathering at the riverfront there, and they're just kind of standing around. Nothing's happening. It's like 30 minutes past when it was supposed to start. And we're like, what, what's going on? It's windy and cold. Didn't look like they were going to march at all. And so some boldness welled up in my spirit, and I said, you know what, guys? Let's just go down there and tell them about Jesus. Let's just take our speaker and just go to where they are. So we did. We went down there. We set the speaker up. We got up on the curb. And I said, attention, everyone. I have something to say. And everyone was like, ooh, what's this guy going to do, right? They thought I was with them. So, so they're all listening. And I riled them up. You know, I did, I did my best, uh, like, political um, hype job or something. I got up there. I said, what are we here for? And they said, you know, freedom and, and liberty and truth and all these kind of things, and they began to get energized, the crowd was energized, and I'm like, yeah, freedom, liberty, truth, that's what we're for, yeah, 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 rah, 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 I said, good, but you need to know, there is no freedom, there is no liberty, there is no truth outside of Jesus Christ, and as soon as those, that name came off my lips, the energy was sucked right out of the riverfront plaza. <laughs> it was like, yeah, yeah. Oh. They shut me right down. Okay, enough, enough. We've heard enough. We've heard enough. No, no, no. I just, I'm just, I'm just getting started. What do you mean you've heard enough? I just, I'm just getting started. They drowned us out, and that was it. People came up to us, talking about, look. If we give you the microphone, then we got to give every religion the microphone. I'm like, no, you don't. You don't, because all the other religions are not true. And they were upset by that. I said, listen, I haven't come here to make friends. I came here to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. And evidently, you don't like it. Yes, it took boldness to crash their event and hijack it for Jesus. But that was 100% the work of God's Holy Spirit. I, I didn't really want to do that. I, I kind of would have been more comfortable just going home. No, I know I would have been more comfortable going home. And that led to some weird stuff happening a few days later, too. Some, some just weird stuff. Slander, and I got calls from people. I'm like, what's going on here? Oh, you're at the river, and you... you I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Maybe we won't all stand up in front of a crowd of lockdown protesters and tell them about how Jesus is the solution, but we all, need, we all need the boldness to uncompromisingly witness for Jesus. We all need the boldness to stand before maybe our co-workers or our family and say, you know what, Christ is the Lord and I won't be silent about him. We all need the boldness to be awkward. 
to stand firm and not compromise and not go along to get along. I agree to disagree. Don't say that. Don't say that. Say I disagree. Jesus is the truth. I'm not going to agree to disagree that you don't believe that. You don't want to hear about Jesus? Don't talk to me. I said that to a few people, and you know what? Every single one of them still talks to me. <laughs> Every single one of them. And you know what? I don't bring up Jesus either. They do. They do. So don't be afraid to be a little bold. Say, you don't want to hear about Jesus? Don't talk to me. I guarantee and nine out of ten of them will come back to you, and they will start the conversation. When the world says these people are drunk, the Bible's outdated. Don't talk about Jesus. Leave your religion at home. We need to stand up and say, no, I will not do any of those things except not be a drunkard. Except be a drunkard. I, I won't do that. But the rest of them, I won't. I won't be quiet about Jesus. I will not hide my love for Jesus. I will stand on the truth of the Bible in public on purpose, intentionally. The good news of the resurrection is too glorious for us to hide and pretend it doesn't affect every area of our lives. I read a quote just before coming here. Uh, I forgot who put it up, but somebody said, um, how did it go? It was, uh, the government declared the church non-essential because the church has been living as if we're non-essential for a long time. Wow. Wow. It was easy for them to tell us we're not essential because we don't believe we're essential. <laughs> As is evidenced by 99.89% of churches closed. We don't believe we're essential. Why should the government believe we're essential? This good news is too good to just give up. Why, why do you think I'm out here preaching in the snow? I don't want to do this. Well, I guess I kind of do. But I would rather be inside somewhere warm. It would be easy for me to just say, you know what, we're just going to have online services. That would be very easy. But this good news of Jesus is too glorious. Like, come on, he went to the cross. He went to, to death. He rose from the dead. And we're just going to, like, Ugh. Get back to your notes before you say something bad. Tell a wrestling story. <laughs> I think this is that's what Pentecost unleashed on the world: uncompromising power, resurrection power. Speaking the word to a dying and scoffing world requires a supernatural boldness. It just does. Peter continues in Acts two twenty nine. He says, "Brothers." I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Well, yeah, that's true. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was, uh, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses." Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. David being a prophet, Peter says, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection. He trusted the promise of God that said one of his descendants would rule and reign forever. How could a descendant of David rule forever? But David had many sons after him and they all multiplied and had sons of their own and daughters of their own, but they all died and stayed dead. Peter says, I have confidence, brothers, that David is dead. Well, that's something easy to have confidence about, isn't it? But one of his descendants is alive, and of that I have confidence too. Now it's true that in the Old Testament there are accounts of resurrections, right? People rising from the dead happened. Even Jesus uh, resurrected people from the dead. Lazarus and Lazarus and in and, and, and a in a uh, a widow's son. There's there's stories of him rise, resurrecting people from the dead. But those people died again and they stayed dead. That's the difference. Jesus is the only one who died and rose and is still alive and will never die ever again. 
So this can only mean that the Messiah is Jesus. The disciples had seen him alive. They spoke with him. They ate with him. Peter is nailing this point over and over again because it is the hinge that holds all our hope together. Jesus is alive. David is not the Messiah. He's dead. He can't be Messiah. This Jesus proved he's Messiah by rising from the dead, of which David even spoke of. Peter quotes David in Acts 2.34. He says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. I love that verse. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. That's what God's doing right now. He's making his enemies his footstool. David himself said that Christ would be highly exalted at the right hand of the Father until all his enemies would be put under his feet. Peter ends his sermon like any good preacher does by summarizing his take-home point. What he wants everyone to take home with them is this in Acts 2.36. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let everyone know. Let everyone know. It's true. This is a short passage of Scripture, but it's loaded. Essentially what Peter is saying is the Messiah whom you're awaiting, whom you believe will save us all, he already came. His name is Jesus. You crucified him. This message of a crucified Messiah would have been tremendously offensive to first century Jews. The Messiah they were awaiting was one of strength, power, victory. What kind of Messiah would come to die on a cross? No, that wasn't the Messiah they were awaiting. Yet, this is the very thing Peter wanted them to know. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, which was speaking through Peter, wanted all Israel to know Jesus is the Messiah, the one you crucified. Yeah, that one. And not only is the crucified one the Messiah, but you crucified him. You killed your own Messiah. I know I said earlier that Peter was not out to condemn anyone, but it sure kind of sounds like he is here. And those who heard him speaking, that they got the same idea. Acts 2.37 records how the people responded. It's interesting. They said, it says here, Now when they heard this, they were all cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? <laughs> oh no, we killed the Messiah. Like, Guys, what are we going to do now? You can feel the desperation in the question. What now? The Holy Spirit was working on the hearts of this crowd. It said they were cut to the heart. You ever been cut to the heart? You realize, oh man, yikes, this, is, this doesn't look good for us. They're cut to the heart. What do we do? They're beginning to realize what Peter was saying was true. They just sat through a marvelous teaching about the resurrection of Jesus, their Messiah and King, and unfortunately, they also have just realized they killed him. So now what? What shall we do with this, Peter? Tell us, is there any hope for us? And the gospel comes like a breath of fresh air. Oh yes, there is, there is hope. Jesus died for you, to forgive you. His resurrection proves the sacrifice was acceptable. Acts 2.38 says... And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received this word were baptized, and, they were, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. What shall we do, brothers? Peter says, repent and be baptized. Repentance means to agree with God, basically. Turn from your wicked ways. Forsake your wicked ways. Change directions. Agree with God. Be not wise in your own eyes. You know, that's one of my favorite, I guess, definitions of repentance is is um, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, trust the Lord. And he will make your path straight. 
He will make your path straight. That's what it is. It's just not trusting yourself. Repentance is going from trusting self to trusting God. Forsaking your old life for the new life. Peter also tells them to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. Baptism is an external expression of an inward reality. You've been buried with Christ, you've died with him, and you've been risen up with him as well in newness of life. This is why when you're baptized, you're dunked under the water, signifying death, and lifted up out of the water, signifying life. Repent and be baptized. Peter tells them the promise is for you and your children. Now that's good news. The promise was for them. The promise is for you. Jesus came to save them. He came to save you. And although it seemed bleak for a moment, the darkness of their sin had been revealed to them. And they thought, "Uh uh-oh, we're in trouble. And then Peter says, no, 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 don't worry. Repent and be baptized. The promise is for you. Wow. That marvelous light burst upon their hearts. It's for you and for your children. So repent and be baptized. The promise is not just for the Jews, though. It's for all nations. This is the decree that God issues now to all people. Repent and be baptized. You know, the, that dreaded R word. Don't say the R word in church. No, no, no. We're going to say it. Repent. It's not a bad word. Just because some street preachers put it in bold capital letters on the sign doesn't make it a bad word. It's still a good word. Repent. It's, it's, it's full of hope and in, in the new life in the future. Turn away from the old way of sin and death and embrace the new way of righteousness and life. What makes this such good news? This promise of eternal life is for everyone, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, or language. Give me any sort of mixture. White woman, it's for you. Black man, it's for you. Asian child, it's for you. All people. Eternal life is not just for Jews. It's for all people in all places. And Peter finishes preaching, and on that day, it says 3,000 people believed, were baptized, repented. Not bad for the first day of church. The Holy Spirit came and empowered Peter to boldly preach Jesus. He remade Peter from a minister of fear to a minister of power, hope, and life. So what do we do now? Well, we do the same thing. The same Holy Spirit that empowered Peter with boldness to witness for Christ is the same Holy Spirit that dwells in you and me if we believe. He hasn't changed. Neither has the gospel. We need him to set a fire of boldness and strength in our weak, frail hearts. We need it, and the lost, dying world needs it. So stop watching fake news media, okay? and start getting into the good news media. I promise you will have more peace. But you don't need to rely on my promise. God promises it. The message of the gospel is life. Jesus Christ died to take away our sins. He rose again proving that his sacrifice was sufficient. How else do you, how, what more proof do you want? And he gives the gift of eternal life to all who believe. If you believe that's true, it must change how you live. It will change how you live. We have the greatest news ever. We have such a rich and real hope, even in dark times. And not only that, we have the Holy Spirit to empower us forward. The world is in shambles, disastrous. True love dictates that we cannot keep this truth to ourselves now. We can't. Be a minister of life and hope. Jesus is the path of life. If we walk with him, then hope and life will characterize us. doesn't mean you're going to be popular, okay? I know these words, hope and life, you know, are good words. But when practically applied to a dying and sinful world that the devil is like kind of uh, uh, working in, uh, guess what? Don't be surprised when people don't like you. Don't be surprised. Men love the darkness rather than light. That's what Jesus said. Doesn't mean we won't have sorrow or pain or suffering. On the contrary, those things will come. But we do not sorrow as those with no hope. There's a way to sorrow with hope. And there's a way to sorrow with no hope. 
Our power is the Holy Spirit, our weapon is the gospel, and our victory is guaranteed. And that's good news. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your glory and grace. Thank you, uh, Lord, for coming and dying on the cross. Thank you for rising from the dead and for loving us, sinners, lost folks, bringing us into your family, into your kingdom. We pray, Lord, now for a baptism of boldness in each and every heart, here and in the far. Uh, we pray, God, that you just um, don't forsake us, don't leave us, but give us wisdom and boldness to proclaim your truth, just as Peter and your early disciples did. Uh, whatever the consequences, we trust you and we love you, and we know that you'll vindicate all your people in your timing and in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Beep, <laughs> beep.